Okay, lovely to be here today. Actually, Pastor Chaz was supposed to be here today, but he, he's gone somewhere else. So. <laughs> when all else fails, get the old bloke. Okay, so we do welcome everybody here, and particularly anybody online today. Um, a message these days goes out well all over the world, and we often don't realise how many people are listening what we call online. And uh, today we're going to be looking at the Word of God. And the title of my talk today is For Such a Time as This. And of course, we get that from the book of Esther. We'll go there straight away. Esther chapter 4. Now, this is the time when um, King of uh, the Persian Empire, Ahasuerus, had married a Jewish girl called Esther. And then there was an enemy of the people uh, who uh, wanted to destroy them. And uh, we know that her, her relative, Mordecai, uh, came to her and said, look, you've got access to the king, and we haven't, and you need to go in, and you need to put the case before him that this guy, Haman, is trying to destroy you. And uh, she sort of said, well, I, the only time I can go into the king, even though he is my husband, is when he calls me. And any other time he could react badly, even lo I could lose my life. I don't think that would have happened, by the way. But uh, he, Mordecai came back on that statement, and we pick it up in Esther chapter 4 and verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to an answer Esther, Think not within thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall thou their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And of course that obviously is what happened. She went into the king, quite a lot of detail there, and eventually there was deliverance there. So I just say my thought is that well, from the day we come to the Lord, there is uh, maybe uh, a thought there that uh, God could use us in ways that we haven't even thought of. We think of the, the prophet Isaiah. Quite early on in there when the Lord was looking for somebody, he said, well, here am I. What, what about me? I, I'm ready. And um, so I think the, my thought is that uh, we're walking on with the Lord. The more we're involved, the more we're ready for God to use us. Let's go to the New Testament, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and this of course is at the time of the dedication of Jesus Christ. When he was eight years old, he was eight days old, he was circumcised, and when he was 40 days old, he came, they, the parents came down from Nazareth to Jerusalem and they presented him to the Lord, which the Bible said to do. But um, the Lord grabbed that opportunity for a couple of very elderly people, maybe about my age. And um, uh, they were uh, really people as much as you could under the Old Testament and difficult times under the Roman Empire. They really were walking with the Lord. And uh, one of them lived almost in the temple, a lady called Anna, uh, and the other man didn't, but he was a godly man. So the, the godly man had to be called into the temple where Jesus was. He didn't have to call Anna because the Lord said, well, she'll be there anyhow. She's there every day. Quite an amazing testimony. And we'll start reading in Luke chapter 2 and in verse 22. And when the days of her purification, that's Mary, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord, to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. So it says he was waiting for the consolation. He would have known all the great scriptures of the Old Testament that said one day there was going to come a Messiah. 
And he was a person who believed that it could happen in his lifetime. But his lifetime was just about over. He was an elderly man, but he went on in that hope. And when God looked around Jerusalem for a person that could offer a, 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 a prayer of dedication, he grabbed this man. This man was ready. And verse uh, 26, And it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the anointed, the, the promised one. Um, and he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took him, he, him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, thou... Lord, now let us thou, thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. For, my, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marvelled at those things which were spoken. In one way you sort of think, well, wouldn't they be expecting that when you think of the miracle of his birth? When both mum and dad knew that, knew that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Ghost. But anyhow, they were, wow, this old man's come in. Where did he come from? Who is he? And then Simeon blessed them. But then he particularly picked out Mary. It's interesting here, he doesn't pick out Joseph because later on when Jesus uh, was preaching, uh, when he was 30 years old, there's no mention of Joseph. So obviously Joseph was not there at that time and later to come into the church. But Mary was. So he, he targets Mary. He said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is for the set, and for, for, set for the fall and rising again, of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, talking about her own salvation, her own conversion, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So these wonderful words flowed out of a godly man. Now, if he had sort of been sort of mucking around and hanging out and doing his own thing, he never would have been chosen. And there would have been a lot of people maybe, I guess, that God looked at, said, no, this is my man. This man's living the life. He's ready. He'll come in and he will speak godly words as I direct him. So then we mentioned the other person, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asa. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. So unfortunately she became a widow, I gather, or it's saying here, only after seven years of marriage. And then for the next, whatever that was, long time, she was a widow. So she would just, her day was in the temple praising the Lord. And she was a widow of fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And she, coming in at that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that look for redemption in Jerusalem. I, my comment always on that is, I wish we had what he, she said, but we don't have that recorded. So here's a couple of people for such a day as this. They didn't know that. The rest of their life was just, year, decade by decade, had been lived and blessed. But for one day, you know, shortly after that, we gather both of them departed this, this earth. Maybe weeks or months, we don't know. But they were there at that crucial moment. For that moment, one, to offer and uh, dedicate uh, Jesus to God. So let's go to another scripture. Well, let's go to the same book, but chapter 22. I want to talk a little bit about the Apostle Peter. An amazing person, an incredibly important person was Peter. And um, we know that God saw leadership in, in Peter over three and a half years from when Peter was con converted. It's interesting when you read the scriptures that he actually had contact with Jesus twice before the day when he caught all the fish. 
You read that in John chapter 1, we won't turn to it now, where John the Baptist referred one, two of his disciples. One was Andrew, uh, Simon Peter's brother, behold the Lamb of God. And uh, anyhow, Andrew then went and got his brother Peter and said, we have found the Messiah. And he brought Peter to Jesus and Jesus said to him, you know, your name is now going to be uh, Petra. And uh, he was uh, uh, a name uh, of, of meaning a rock. And then later on, when his mother-in-law was raised up, you read all this in uh, Luke chapter 4, he raised up from a fever, and then in chapter 5, when Jesus walks along. So you might say that he, he had three times that uh, uh, were needed to convert him. And he was a controversial guy. He was often saying things that he shouldn't say. Even on one occasion, Jesus called him Satan, said, you're speaking like the devil. So, but in the end, Jesus recognised this man they will follow. They had a, an argument just before this, who was the greatest. Well, it had already been proved that Peter had the leadership. And Jesus knew in that critical transfer from him dying and, and, going, and being raised and going to heaven to the church, Peter was as the most important person. Because if he blows it, they'll all follow him in the wrong direction. But let's just read, first of all, what Jesus said to him here in Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So he picked him out. He said, right, now's your time. I mean, Peter then boasted that he would never deny the Lord, and the Lord said, yes, you will. Before the crock throw, you'll de deny me three times, which he did. So that was a very traumatic time for Peter. He was obviously confused. It says he cursed and he went back to the, his old way of talking and when the three times that uh, they said to him, you know, you were one of them and he denied it. So then the Lord dies, which shatters them all. They don't fully understand it, even though the Lord had prepared them as much as he could for that. And then three days later, he rises from the dead. But Peter's not down at the, at the uh, uh, tomb and yet he could have been because Jesus said three days and three nights pretty clear in the end that I'll rise from there. He wasn't there, but Mary Magdalene was. And we know the story of how she mistook Jesus for the gardener. But then she went and told Peter, and Peter then ran. He wasn't as good a runner as John, who was a lot younger. And they both went down to the tomb. They saw the grave clothes just lying there as Jesus had gone through them. They weren't unwrapped. He'd gone through them as he rose from the dead. And uh, he witnessed all that, but he was still utterly confused. And so it went on like that. And yet uh, that prayer was still there. When you are converted, I want you to lead the, 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 the brethren. And then we just know there that um, after a while, he, you know, um, he, um, he went fishing again to prove his leadership and how that they would follow him. He suddenly said, I'm going back to my old way of life and going fishing. And six of the, of the disciples went with him. A couple of them could have been fishermen like James and John and Andrew. We most probably were. But other people, they were mostly never been fishing in their life. I think maybe if Nathaniel who was an educated man, who knows. But there was quite a group of them went fishing. And it, it, as, as usual, it failed. And the Lord made sure that it failed. And then the Lord appeared on the bank and all of that story. T typical impetuous Peter, he leaps over the side to swim ashore. He doesn't even wait for them. They've caught all this fish when the Lord said, you know, 153 fish. Another story there I won't go into. And then they're sitting down and the Lord's prepared some food for them. And they're eating fish and bread and everything's lovely. And the Lord suddenly picks on him. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And he makes you hardly even thinking what he says. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Throw away line. And then we know he, he targets him, targets him three times. And typical Peter, right? He gets irritable. You know that I love you. Why do you ask me three times? The Lord could have said, Will you deny me three times? I'm now making sure you confess me three times. And so it goes on like that. And then finally, we know there's the ascension. And then where are we now? Where, where's Peter? Where's this critical person? For such a time as this, Peter. 
That's what you're here for, for such a time as this, to go out and leave. And by that time, seven days before Pentecost, by the way, they didn't know it was going to be Pentecost. They could have gone on for years for all they knew. Uh, Peter gathers them together. He's finally doing the leadership thing. And he starts off with, we need to appoint another 12th apostle. Apostle. Judas was no good, he's gone, goes through all the scriptures, and the end of, you read at the end of, uh, of uh, Acts chapter 1, they appoint that uh, wonderful person, Matthias, who had been with them right back, and so I won't go into all of that. And then seven days later, I'd gather, Peter would say, right, every day we just keep praying. We don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to happen. They didn't, even though there were prophecies of speaking in tongues, they didn't know that. Then on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus died as the Passover lamb, on the Passover, at the day of the Passover, we know that the Holy Ghost gets poured out. And again, Peter, for such a day as this, you're here. So Peter stands up and he gives a great sermon. And uh, he goes back to the book of Joel. This was prophesied back there. He quotes that scripture very accurately. And so it goes on. And then shortly after that, we know this great persecution. And Peter again is in the front line. But by this time, he is leading the church as he should have done. So um, let's have a look at another thought here. Acts chapter 15. Before I finish with Peter, because the Lord goes on using Peter. Although it's interesting, Peter, Acts chapter 15, by this time, has, you could almost say, suffered the humility. I don't think he would have seen it that way. Of the Lord's half-brother, James, becoming more the dominant leader of the church. You know what, often uh, I had a couple of experiences in my life, maybe, maybe part of my thought on this, where you look back and you can see that the Lord did direct you and for such a time as this, blah, 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 I was there. And, um, but I was there just a moment, something that I could do, the Lord obviously felt that I could do it. But then later on, he moved me out of the way and let somebody else come in. And a couple of them were in the first couple of years I was in the Lord. I was in Port Lincoln. I'd gone over there to help with the little church that, that was there at the time. And uh, they had a need for somebody to help out. And I was only 19 at the time. But the fellowship was in, in South Australia was in chaos because there'd been a split in the Geelong Assembly and uh, uh, some elders had broken away. And we in South Australia had followed the wrong, we're back the wrong horse to use a worldly term and uh, things are in chaos um, but anyhow we're doing our best and we're not involved in the main fellowship at the time and then there was a brother there who had been previously running the church in, in Port Lincoln came back and he wanted to take the fellowship back into a previous split with Leo Harris and the CRC and I knew at that time I didn't want to go down that path because I knew they didn't quite preach what I now believe. And they had some extreme on demons. And I went on a fast. I won't go into all the detail. I was three days into the fast and I didn't know quite what to do. I'd gone to Port Lincoln thinking I'd stay there, who knows, forever. I can't remember what I was thinking. But all of a sudden this was happening. The fellowship was going into another group, which I didn't agree with. And anyhow, I had some prayer. And one night on the third day of my fast, I had... I can only call it a revelation. I heard no voice. There was no voice. But there was a very strong impression on my mind. Three o'clock in the morning, I couldn't sleep that night, that uh, I was to go to Elizabeth. Why Elizabeth? I've not, I hadn't even never thought of Elizabeth before. Elizabeth was a brand new town. Only been going for a few years. This is 1962, by the way. And uh, so only I got up next morning, I went and saw this, this brother. His name was John. Uh, John uh, Borden and I said I had this little revelation now he was sceptical by the way I'm usually sceptical when people say that because in Pentecost I've got God talking to them every five minutes which is rubbish to be quite frank for God to actually do something like that it'd be extremely rare if it happened once in your lifetime it'd be amazing if it happened twice that's even more amazing you know, he appeared to, to King Solomon twice. And later on, he held that to Solomon. So I appeared to you twice, and yet you've done what you've done. 
So anyhow, so he was a bit sceptical, but I was convinced that it was right. Within three days I was gone. My brother Ben had just moved there a couple of months before and I went and bored. I didn't want to go home to mum and dad. I'd left home by that time. And, and just the two or three of us up at Elizabeth started to hold little meetings and get, getting a couple of converts. And one day I was taken aside by uh, the pastor at the time, a man called Peter Mullen, and he said to me, are you trying to start a, a fellowship right on our back door? Because at that time the Adelaide Assembly had about 60 people. Pastor John was the two I see, and, uh, and they were running a very successful assembly in Adelaide, down in Wayville. And uh, so I said, no, no, I'm not trying to do that. I just want to see if I can get a couple of converts going. I believe the Lord has uh, you know, directed me that way. And again, they were fairly, oh yeah. So I, did, I wasn't offended by that, by the way, because I know how I reacted to that. So anyhow, I won't go into all the detail, but the Adelaide Assembly collapsed. It was a sad day because the pastor at the time, not Pastor John, the other chap, Peter, he committed adultery. That's not a good day for the church. Now, you wouldn't believe why the people then left. Not because he'd committed adultery, but because they loved Peter, and he was a very lovable guy. I won't go into all of that now. But they, they felt that if we can't have Peter, because he'd gone, he'd shot through, then we're not interested. So one Sunday, in, in the middle of 1962, when we'd only been, I'd only been Elizabeth a couple of months and only had maybe half a dozen converts, one Sunday we had 50 or 60 people and the next Sunday in Adelaide we had nothing. And all we had left for us in Adelaide was this little handful of people up at Elizabeth. Pastor John had been coming up from Adelaide and uh, when I ran some of the meeting, he, he was giving the talk. Not, not that he wasn't involved, he was involved, but he was still living down in Glenside. We had no idea that that's what the future was going to happen. So I feel that, obviously, I believe that that was justified my thought that, uh, that well, the, the revelation that God had given me, I needed to go there. Now, later on, I didn't live in Elizabeth for the rest of my life. And Pastor John certainly became the, the senior pastor, as it should be, up, up when we moved to Elizabeth. And it wasn't until many, many years later, in 1976, that eventually when our Adelaide Assembly had grown from uh, way down south, right up north, the one day when we outgrew the, the hall at Elizabeth, Pastor John said, it's time to go back to Adelaide. What he meant was we'd left there back those years before, in 1962, and now it's time to go back, and we did in 1976. And the only other time that's ever happened to me, uh, I'm running out of time, aren't I, both in this talk and in my little stories, um, was uh, a couple of years later in 1965 when I was uh, uh, at a Ballarat camp up in uh, the uh, uh, old air base at, uh, at um, Ballarat. I won't go into it all. At the communion service, I had a very strong impression against all I can say that, I would, that Helen and I would marry. I was married by this time, only a few, few months we should go to Kangaroo Island. Now, I had never gone to Kangaroo Island, wasn't interested in going to Kangaroo Island. Pastor John had gone over, and again, I won't go into all the detail, and there was a handful of people in, in the fellowship, some connected here today, by the way, and, uh, and uh, anyhow, I went and saw Pastor John straight after the talk, and I said, I believe the Lord is asking me to go to Kangaroo Island. Um, I was uh, uh, 22, Helen was only 18, we were a couple of kids, really, uh, and uh, Pastor John said he was again a little, oh yeah, okay, yeah, the Lord's told you. And again, I wasn't offended by that because I know how I, I am on that sort of thing. So he said, oh, well, you better come and tell Pastor Lloyd. And I, um, uh, it's amazing how small the fellowship was back then. The whole oversight of that camp fitted into his car. Now, he always liked buying these big American cars. He got them dirt cheap at auctions and it had a big bench seat and he could fit four on each seat, four in the front and four on the back. Well, at that camp in 1967, there were only seven pastors there. And Pastor Lloyd, I remember, sat behind the steering wheel and Pastor John said, look, Jock's got something he wants to say. Can he come? I already knew Pastor Lloyd. So we're sitting in the car, and I'm sitting straight behind Pastor Lloyd in the back seat. And I remember the car all fogged up. We couldn't see outside after a while. But uh, anyhow, forget, forget that. And Pastor Lloyd suddenly said, before we discuss anything else, 
I've got Trudy Bohm ringing me almost every day, wanting somebody to come to Kangaroo Island. And um, Pastor John just said straight away, OK, we think we've got that covered. I won't go into all the detail. Helen and I turned up, just a couple of kids, and we were there only for a few months. And I go back to the point. Sometimes you need, do what you've got to do, and it's better if you step back. And it came to a point when it really needed, I think, somebody else other than me to run the assembly. We got up to mid-30s and we had a great revival. And I, I, Helen and I never actually brought any to the, anybody personally to the meeting, but we just ran, if I, I can say, at a happy meeting. And then uh, John Smith, who married uh, Juanita, uh, he took over the assembly and, and it went on from there. So there's just, my, by the way, that's never happened. That's nearly 60 years ago. And the Lord's obviously decided no good for anything else. But uh, we're still here. But uh, you don't know. I feel on both those occasions, to prove my point, if nothing had happened, then I was making it up and so on. Here, yeah, gosh, I've run out of time. Let's have a look at Acts 15, talking about Peter. Now, as I said, the Lord used Peter again. And he used him lots of times when you read the book of Acts. But on one occasion, we know God particularly used him for the conversion of the Gentiles. And in, in not turning to Acts 10 now, because in Acts 15, he refers to that, of how God used him at that moment to be involved in the conversion of the Gentiles. And we know in Acts 15 the debate was whether the Gentiles should keep the law or not. Somewhere in the church saying, yes, they've got to keep the law. And Paul, who was uh, far more expert on that sort of thing than most of them, said, no, we don't think they should keep the law. And they go down to Jerusalem and various people had their say, well, I want to pick it up in Acts 15 verse 7 where Peter goes through how for such an occasion God chose him in verse 7 and when there had been much disputing Peter rose up and said unto them men and brethren you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe so what does he say there God had other choices he had other choices. There were other apostles. But on this occasion, he said, no, Peter's my man. I need somebody with a bit of courage. I need somebody who's prepared to do something out of the box. Guess who's better at that than anybody? The apostle Peter. That nature was still there. And uh, so he said, a choice of the choices, all of us, but he chose me. And verse 8, And God which knoweth the hearts that bear them witness giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. He, he, he supported Peter, as you know, by also. He put no difference between uh, us and them, purifying their hearts. And so it goes on. But just the point that Peter's making, for such a moment as this, I was the right guy on the block, you might say. Let's go to Acts chapter 9, conversion of Paul. In a very similar situation. And we have... I, I shouldn't use the word, but, but it is a saying in our society about somebody that's not important. They're a nobody. No, but just somebody, average, run of the mill. And I, I got a feeling, that's a, I'm not really saying he was, I'm just saying that's a saying in our society. That God chose a person we don't know anything about. We, doesn't know, we don't know his credentials. We don't know whether it was in the oversight. He most probably wasn't. He was just a good, good, solid brother in the Lord. And this man, of course, who uh, God uh, chose to uh, bring Paul into the kingdom of God. We, know the, we won't go through the experience Paul or Saul went through at that time on the road to Damascus. But in verse 8, chapter 9, verse 8, And Saul rose up from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple. That's how he's described. A brother in the Lord, will say. A certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Now, that statement says a lot. He was ready to be used. He didn't know he was going to be used. Just a good brother in the Lord. And he just said, I'm here. What do, you, what do you want me to do? Sort of thing. 
And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that uh, he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath, here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that, uh, all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into, entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord... Um, that's interesting, isn't he? He's not a brother yet. But he knew he was going to be a brother because the Lord had indicated that. The Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight again, and he rose, and Ananias baptised him. He obviously prayed with him to receive the Holy Spirit. It doesn't give the detail here, but later on Paul said, I love speaking in tongues. So there you are, and maybe another example. Walking with the Lord, oh, I guess my main point here today is that you never know when God's going to call upon any... It might not be something as dramatic as this. It could be just us witnessing to some individual. And I want to give an example of that. In Acts chapter, same book, Acts chapter 18, I want to talk about this couple called um, um, Aquila and Priscilla. In Acts chapter 18... In verse 1, And after these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius, the emperor, had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And he came unto them, so that is, uh, Paul came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for they, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Well, you could say, hang on a second, Paul wasn't a tent maker, he was a Pharisee. He was a leader in the Sanhedrin. But obviously he couldn't go on with that occupation after he came to the Lord. And somewhere along the line he needed to make a buck, as we would say. And uh, he learned how to make tents. I'm sure before he came to the Lord he never made a tent in his life. But anyhow, both of them were tent makers. And I would imagine sat down, chatting about the Lord and making tents. In verse 4, And he reasoned, that's, that's Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, persuading the Jews and the Greeks. I want to jump down to verse 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there for a good time, for a good while, um, and took his leave of the brethren. Uh, this is in Ephesus, by the way. And he sailed thence into Syria and goes on about Paul. And uh, oh no, this in verse 19, he came to Ephesus and left them there. Uh, now, sorry, this is where they get to Ephesus. So Aquila and Priscilla are with him. He, they arrive in Ephesus, then he leaves them there, but he goes back to Jerusalem. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they desired him to tarry longer with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, and he went out to Jerusalem. But he did say, I'll come again. And we have the great story in Acts chapter 19, when he did come again, and he met the 12 disciples of John the Baptist, and so the, the church starts. But let's leave, and we now have Aquila and Priscilla, his companions, still in Ephesus, and uh, they obviously were thinking about the Lord, obviously a great couple in the Lord. And they, I would imagine, went to the synagogue to witness to people. That's where they did a lot of their evangelism, in the synagogue. And we just pick it up there in verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. And this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So here we are. We've got two different groups here. We've got Apollos over here, great orator, 
Huge knowledge of the Word of God, but only up to John the Baptist. And over here in the same synagogue, with a totally different reason they're there, is Aquila and Priscilla. They've come in to witness the people. They maybe had done that before and had maybe zero result, we don't know. But all of a sudden, they're there for such a time as this, Aquila and Priscilla. For such a time as this, you're here to hear this man and to tell him the full gospel. In verse 26, and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them. Not quite sure what that means. They went back to their, their, their home or went aside, but they said, we've got something to tell you. And they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren, goes on about Apollos. The main point I'm knowing is Aquila and Priscilla, it was their moment. And uh, this, who later on became a great uh, apostle in the Lord, Apollos. So I've nearly run out. I am down to the last page, which is quite miraculous. Am I really? Look at that. Okay. I've got a couple of scriptures to finish on. Luke chapter 18. Before I read that, maybe one little other story. It's a great testimony which a lot of us know anyhow. And again, I, ve- I very much think for such a day as this was when uh, Brother Jed Pillen witnessed to James. Who knows James? A lot of hands do. Some, you, some of you don't know James. These days he's in the Perth Assembly. And um, uh, Jed is a counsellor at one of the colleges, a, a, a religious college, Tyndale, and um, he had lots of students come to him with troubles. And James had come to him two or three through times through the last year at school, year 12. And he had a few, I won't go into all that, he had a few problems. And he really respected uh, Jed, felt that Jed had something. Jed was not in a position to witness to him because um, he... Um, got to be careful as a school teacher or as a counsellor, you lose your job. You've got to be careful, even though it was a Christian college. And um, to talk about the Lord organising it, I really feel the Lord was very much in the hand of this. And that is um, that on that last couple of hours of that last day at school, uh, uh, Jed's uh, timetable was full. He has a personal assistant and she had come to him and said, towards the end of the day, she said, such and such a boy has cancelled. He can't come. But I've got James Marston uh, here and he wants to see you. Can you see him? Now, if that's not the Lord setting up something, I don't know what is. So he comes in right, year, year 12's over, leaving school, last couple of minutes and Jed's sitting there and he's not, he, not the only person that Jed has talked to about the Lord, but he suddenly says to James, do you believe in God? Yeah. Are you a Christian? Yes. What church do you go? Methodist? Uniting? And so, so on and so forth. He said, do you ever try to convert some of your mates? Yes. Uh, how do you do that? He said, I've got this book. It's quite a good book, actually. It's like Baptist level and proving the, the Bible by archaeology or history or all of those things. It's not, there's nothing wrong with it. Just not miracles. And, and, and he said, I give him this book to read. And he said, does it work? He said, no, they never read the book. And then uh, Jed said, well, I'll tell you my testimony, which is, for those who know, an amazing testimony out of the drug scene, a bit like our brother Lawrence said before, earlier on, s- same sort of background. And uh, goes through his testimony. And James, you, when you talk to him, he really listens. And he would have been sitting there listening. And, then, and Jed said, why don't you come on Sunday to Elizabeth, where Jed was going at the time, and get baptised and receive the, get baptised properly and receive the Holy Spirit and he did and the, the old saying the rest is history and he hit the ground running recently I said to um, to brother Jed I said haven't you got another James for us and he said I talked to a lot of boys but so far not so it's just now and again you don't know um, this passage here just a fin- final thought on um, the situation we find ourselves in. Maybe for the whole fellowship, I'm daring to say, for such a day as this we're here, to uphold the truth, 
to reinstate, as we hopefully have done for decades, the original Christianity you read about in the book of Acts. That we want to do it according to the book. We want to read a book like the book of Acts and say, hey, we're in harmony with that. We read the church at Corinth and we have a communion. We have the spiritual gifts. All of these things which unfortunately so many groups have dropped. So my final thought today is maybe for such a time as this, when we feel that the return of the Lord is imminent, any moment, any time now can happen. And why am I grabbing this? Because of this parable and the final point the Lord made. So it's Luke chapter 8 in verse 1. He spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint or give up. Saying, this, there, was in a city, there was in a city a judge which feared not God neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. In other words, I need some justice here. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So he really is not a very nice guy. And he's saying, well, I'll do what she wants, but not for her sake, for my sake. I don't care about her, but she'll go on pestering me, so I'll do it. And then he says... So if this lady got justice from such a bad guy, well, what sort of justice can you expect from me? You're God. I am the righteous judge. The Lord, and then um, verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust ju- judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he be along with them? Maybe now and again we feel the Lord takes a while to do what we want him to do. But in the end, we know he always does. And then the last verse, one we often quote, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Well, brothers and sisters, we can say yes if we keep on, 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 on in the Lord. And all the people said, Amen. Okay, we're going to have a time of prayer now in closing. and also.